Um, I'm seeing, here it is. Here is our okay. PowerPoint presentation. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, Lori. I'm just awfully glad to see so many of you here tonight and very happy to talk about these women. Many of you have probably been to Cantini. You have been to the Robert McCormick Museum, but I feel like there's another story to be told besides uh, what you get when you go on a tour. Please do ask your questions and please, I hope you have uh, printed out the family tree, refer to that family tree as I will be doing and help you through this group of women. Nobody personifies this quote on the screen more than Robert McCormick and Joseph Medill. You know, together they built one of the largest publishing empires in the country but individually, they forever shaped politics, newspapers, and the city of Chicago. But the point of my program is that this was a family very short on male heirs. So while these two men were building their empires, it was up to their wives, daughters, and other female relatives to put their own stamp on our city. This was when a women or when women routinely did not go to college, certainly when they could not vote. But these women did have one thing that others did not. They had a fortune. And this provided a certain amount of freedom as they made the advances that they were interested in. Their marriages were often mergers of powerful families, which not only extended their influence, but extended their wealth. Joseph Medill came to Chicago in the 1850s. He became owner and editor of the Chicago Tribune. He helped found the Republican Party and get Abraham Lincoln elected president. He was also the mayor of Chicago after the Great Fire. His wife, Catherine, was always known as Kitty, and she was his partner in business as well as in life. She was college educated and worked side by side with her husband as they worked on building the Tribune. Like many, excuse me. Like many society women of the day, Kitty was a club woman and a volunteer. She was a founding member of something called the Fortnightly Club which is still a very prestigious club in the city of Chicago. During the Civil War, she worked for the Sanitary Commission, which was a precursor to the Red Cross. During the Great Fire, Kitty and her friends were dismayed to find out that women and children were being left out of the relief efforts. So they founded their own organization and put money directly into the hands of the women and their children who needed it the most. The Medills were a family of style and influence. Their 36 room mansion on the corner of Wabash and Ontario cost $100,000 to build during the day. Um, unfortunately, this mansion is no longer standing, but if you look at it, the very top third floor was the ballroom. The family soon grew to include three daughters, Catherine, who was called Kate, Eleanor, who was called Nellie, and Josephine, who was always known as Josie. Kate and Nellie were combative, arrogant, and intensely jealous of each other. Neither one of them had Josie's sweet nature or their mother's philanthropic spirit. The biggest blow to the family came when Josie died at the age of 25. And this really did cause a great hole in the family. I mentioned that ballroom on top of their mansion. Joseph Medill held his daughter's funeral in that ballroom and vowed it would never be used again. Both of the women, Kate and Nellie, attended St. Mary's Academy in South Bend. And they were fairly active in college affairs, but marriage was the end game. Like all young society women of the day, they knew any advancement or achievement they might accomplish would have to come through the marriage to an important man. 
Kate was a beautiful redhead with a fiery temper. And she really thought that marriage to Robert S. McCormick, nephew of Reaper King Cyrus McCormick, would give her all the luxuries of life. The two were married in 1876, but it was an unlikely match from the very beginning. Robert had rejected the Reaper business and the wealth that went with it. He wanted to be a lawyer and then he wanted to be a commodities broker, but he was a failure at both. And this forced him to take loans from his father-in-law to make Kate happy. Eventually though, Robert did achieve success as a United States ambassador. And they had posts in London, Paris, Vienna, and St. Petersburg, Russia, which finally gave Kate the lifestyle she had aspired to. Robert and Kate had three children. Their second child, Katrina, died in infancy. Kate gained the edge by giving her father his very first grandson and naming him Joseph Medill McCormick, a little boy they always called Medill. Their second son was called Robert Rutherford in an attempt to make it look like there was Scottish, excuse me, Scottish royalty in McCormick blood. The two boys rarely lived with their parents. They were shuttled off to English boarding schools before going to Groton and Yale on the East Coast. Nellie married Robert Patterson in 1878. His family had founded the very prestigious Second Presbyterian Church in Chicago. This is the church with the famous Tiffany windows and the family helped found the community of Lake Forest. But soon after their small wedding, Nellie was calling her husband, in her words, a hopeless drag on society. But Robert Patterson proved himself to Joseph Medill first as night editor of the Tribune and rising to take over the paper as editor in chief. Nellie had two children as well. She couldn't resist naming her son Joseph Medill Patterson, but had to settle with calling him Joe. Her daughter was named Eleanor, but everybody called her Sissy. In an act of defiance that only a teenage girl can do, Sissy changed the spelling of her first name so that the spelling of Eleanor was different for her than it was with her mother. Grandfather Medill, who you see in this picture in the center, looking an awful lot like Sean Connery, in my opinion, really did not care for spoiled boys, but he adored his granddaughter. At age 18, Sissy inherited 10 shares of Tribune stock outright, in addition to all the dividends she would share with her brother and cousins. Kate and Nellie really could never tame their need for luxury and social advancement. It took precedent over their marriages, over motherhood, and any kind of volunteer work they might do. Both had mansions in Chicago and Washington, D.C., but never seemed interested in living in any of them. The house you see in the upper left-hand corner on 20 East Burton Place still stands today. It has been turned into very high-end luxury condominiums. This was a gift from Joseph Medill to his daughter, Nellie. The house below, of course, is the former Red Oaks farm that we know as Cantini. This was a house, or rather a gift, from Joseph to his daughter, Kate. But Kate was appalled by this. She didn't want some farmhouse. She just called it a farmhouse out in the middle of nowhere. She wanted a downtown mansion, and she was no, never Kate satisfied with Cantini and rarely went to that home. They both had houses in Washington, D.C. The house in the lower right, which belonged to Kate, is now the um, National Embassy for Brazil. The house at the top called Patterson House is uh, still open and it is a private club now. <laughs> 
I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with the slide. I'm just going to point out that Kate died of a heart attack in Versailles, France in 1932. Nellie, who by this time had moved to the Drake Hotel, died one year later. Both of them are buried next to husbands they did not love and very close to each other in the Medill family plot at Graceland Cemetery. Now, Medill McCormick was Kate's oldest son, but his true love in life was Ruth Hanna. Medill and Ruth were married on June 6, 1903 in her home state of Ohio. But Kate was devastated by, by this match, regardless of Ruth's very elite pedigree. And she refused to attend the wedding. But Ruth's maid of honor was Alice Roosevelt, President Roosevelt's daughter. And Teddy Roosevelt himself attended this wedding. And with his blessing, this couple was off and running in the world of progressive politics. Medill was heir apparent to the Chicago Tribune, but gave it up mm -hmm. in favor of being a politician, first in Springfield and then in Washington, DC. Ruth was a natural at politics as well. Her first big achievement was to help secure partial suffrage to Illinois women in 1913. She was her husband's most trusted advisor in progressive issues like child labor, the eight hour workday, and of course the right to vote. Together, Medill and Ruth were very popular, constantly in the news. They were very much the Bill and Hillary or Michelle and Barack of their day. But their three children really did take second stage to all of this attention. Despite his political success, Despite his loving family, Medill McCormick waged a very long and private war with depression. When he failed to win re-election to the Senate in 1925, he committed suicide in Washington. Well, as you can imagine, Ruth is devastated by this. And so she decides to leave Washington and move to Rockford, Illinois. She purchases two newspapers, a radio station, and manages her 2,200 acre dairy farm. But politics were in her blood. And by 1928, she was campaigning again, but this time for herself, <coughs> excuse me. Her slogan was no promises, no bunk. And she was elected to Congress and returned to Washington. This feat landed Ruth on the cover of Time Magazine, making her one of the very first female politicians to receive that kind of attention. Eventually though, Ruth does give up politics and she remarries Albert Sims in 1932. They moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico, where she founds a school, works in the arts and develops another cattle ranch. But tragedy struck again when her son Johnny was killed in 1938 while taking pictures in the mountains. Johnny was the only male grandchild of Kate and Robert S. McCormick and the only male who could have carried forward that family name. She endowed the Fountain Valley School for Boys in Colorado in his honor. Ruth Hannah McCormick spent the remainder of her life following her passions, including the Republican Party. But she died in 1944 of an illness and is buried in Albuquerque. Katrina was the oldest child of Ruth and Medill. And um, she married Cortland Barnes in 1935. Katrina was as liberal as the rest of this family was conservative, and she especially did not care for her uncle Robert McCormick's brand of politics. In 1945, Trini sold all of her Tribune stock back to Robert McCormick for $3 million and then promptly gave away all of that money. <laughs> In her mind, it was dirty money simply because of the politics behind it. 
Katrina would go on to publish Common Sense, a very leftist magazine, and endowed a scholarship in her name to minority students at the University of Denver. Of Ruth McCormick's two surviving children, it was Basie who went on to follow the Medill newspaper legacy. Basie married Peter Miller in 1941, and together they operated all of her mother's newspapers in the state of Illinois. When her uncle Robert McCormick purchased the Washington Times Herald in 1949, he installed Basie as its editor. So the young Miller family moves to Washington where Basie quickly finds herself butting heads with politicians, editors, and even her own uncle, who was micromanaging the newspaper from Chicago. She and Robert begin to differ politically and personally, and this caused a pretty big shift in what was once a very close relationship. Eventually, Robert McCormick fires Basie for no other reason than she decided to divorce her husband and remarry. He then puts the newspaper up for sale. Well, Basie and her husband, Gavin Tankersley, tried desperately to buy the newspaper, but they really cannot come up with enough money. And he ends up selling the entire thing to the Washington Post in 1951. Basie and Gavin decide they have had it with Washington and they decide to move to Arizona where they become the premier breeders and trainers of Arabian horses. But Basie is still a very wealthy woman and she devotes herself not only to the ranch but to different philanthropies and especially the Black Stallion Reading Program for disadvantaged children which she helped found. Basie died at the age of 91 in 2013, and she is buried in Arizona. Robert McCormick really never did fall in love until he was in his 30s, and he met Amy Irwin Adams. Amy came from an elite military family. She was born at Fort Riley, Kansas, but educated in France. Her father was a West Point graduate and the first man to receive the Congressional Medal of Honor for bravery. The entire family moved to Chicago in 1893. And as a reminder, that's the year of the world's Columbian Exposition. Well, Amy and Robert meet and they become increasingly close, but Amy has one really big problem. She's already married She's married to a man named Edward Adams from Lake Forest. Her affair with Robert rapidly became the talk of the town and that gossip grew when she filed for divorce. So here's our Amy with an impeccable pedigree, a member of the very Tony Onwensia Club in Lake Forest, an accomplished artist, gardener, club woman, horsewoman, being completely slandered in the press. And on top of it, that slander is coming from Robert McCormick's own mother, Kate. Kate did not approve of Amy as a wife for her son, in part because she was seven years older than Robert McCormick. Kate contributed to all the gossip by constantly calling Amy that old hag. Kate is at her wit's end about this thing. She decides to threaten disinheritance, she tries more slanderous threats, and she finally hits on the idea of a long separation and a bribe to keep these two people apart. Kate used her connections in Russia to give Robert a chance to interview Tsar Nicholas and the Russian army. She sweetened the deal by giving Robert $50,000 as a gift. So McCormick sets off for London on his way to Russia in 1915. Very few people knew that Amy was following him on a different ship and would be staying at a different hotel. The two were secretly married on March 10th, 1915 at St. George's Hanover Square in London. And as you can well imagine, Kate was furious for her entire life. 
and never accepted Amy into the family and never forgave Robert for doing this. And Robert never returned the $50,000. Instead, among other things, he bought his wife a beautiful double strand pearl necklace that she wore every day for the rest of her life. Amy took on the life of an army wife, although a pretty privileged one. Her honeymoon was spent in Russia where the Colonel did indeed interview the Tsar. She followed him to San Antonio when the National Guard was mobilized on the Mexican border. And that was in 1916. World War I took both McCormick's to Paris where Robert joined Pershing and the first division. Now, Amy is an army brat and she knew she couldn't be a soldier, but she wanted to serve in the only way that women could in those days, and that was to become a nurse. She drove an ambulance as well as worked in the field hospitals while her husband and brother were fighting the war. The McCormicks returned to Chicago after the war and they set up household in a beautiful home on Astor Street in the Gold Coast. But much to their dismay, all of that old gossip was following them and continued to bother them. So they decided to move to the peace and quiet of Kate's Wheaton home, Red Oaks Farm. And the first thing they did was rename it Cantini in honor of the battle that Robert had fought in, in France. Amy absolutely adored this lifestyle where she could ride, raise her dogs, her livestock and paint and garden. Amy though was diagnosed with cancer in 1937. She kept up appearances by writing, by painting, by entertaining. She continued the Cantini Christmas tradition of always holding a huge party for all the Cantini farm children. She also continued the Friday night dinners and movies in the Gold Theater. Amy passed away in August of 1939. She was buried in her nurse's uniform with full military honors. The service was conducted at Cantini around a horseshoe shaped altar covered in dahlias, which were her favorite flowers. And the Colonel's airplane scattered rose petals over the ceremony and the guests. If you look at the lower picture in the right, uh, you are looking at the east porch uh, where the long cascade of stairs and the reflecting pool is. And in the upper left hand corner, you can see that airplane preparing to spread the rose petals. Ultimately, a beautiful tomb was designed, flanked by statues of Amy's beloved German shepherds. Robert's last gesture was to change the birth of Amy on her tombstone to imply that the two were born in the same year, thereby getting rid of that stigma of people always calling her the older woman. A few years after Amy passed away, the Colonel began spending more time with Marilyn Matheson Hooper. Marilyn was a friend of Amy's. They were in the same bridge club together. Uh, Marilyn's family was in the same social circle as the McCormick's out here in the Western suburbs. After her divorce, the Colonel and Mar Marilyn married on December 21st, 1944 in the downtown apartment of the Colonel's cousin, Chauncey McCormick. And of course, you know Chauncey as the owner of St. James Farm. Marilyn relished her role as Mrs. Robert R. McCormick. Her parties in Chicago and Washington were sought after invitations and the couple's annual Christmas party was always considered the social event of the season. She loved to ride and spent many happy hours on horseback with her husband, as well as sharing his love of dogs and traveling around the world. And notice in this picture, she is sitting side saddle. Both Amy and Marilyn were experts at riding side saddle and taking jumps. Marilyn loved collecting Asian art and decorating her homes. And like Amy, Marilyn was a passionate dog lover 
contributing regularly to the Anti-Cruelty Society downtown. The Colonel passed away in 1955, but Marilyn outlived him by 30 years. His will granted her $100,000 yearly income for the rest of her life, but no say in Tribune business. When the mansion became a museum, Marilyn lived in Washington, DC, and then finally ending up in beautiful um, apartments along Lakeshore Drive. She died after a short illness in 1985 and is buried in the Medill family plot at Graceland. Little Eleanor Patterson, who I said was always called Sissy, was the daughter of Eleanor and Robert Patterson and the only granddaughter of patriarch Joseph Medill. Oh, but she was a wild child, giving her mother fits over decorum and men and society. Eventually though, Sissy does finally finish up with some kind of schooling back East and has a lavish debut at her mother's Washington DC house. Her gown was by Worth, her jewels were by Cartier. And I love this story about poor Alice Roosevelt, daughter of the president. She complained bitterly to her father that her debut wasn't nearly as lavish as Sissy Patterson's. And poor President Roosevelt said he was just doing the best he could on a presidential salary. In 1902, Sissy was presented to the Royal Court in Vienna under the watchful eye of her Aunt Kate. It is there that she met Count Joseph Gazicki, who everybody called Gizzy. Sissy was immediately smitten despite his advanced age and very questionable background. She was determined to marry him. Even her good friends and her cousins could not dissuade her from this marriage that ultimately took place on April 14th, 1904 in the drawing room of the Washington House. Well, dreams of living in a castle were very quickly dashed when Sissy arrived at the Count's rundown home in Poland. Her charmed life was now one of loneliness, abuse from her husband in a country she did not understand or appreciate. Sissy gave birth to a daughter in 1905 and named her Felicia, but the marriage continued to fail. Finally, when Felicia was two years old, Sissy took her daughter and they fled to London. She resumed her frenzied social life, leaving the daughter with the care of nannies and governesses. So the Count, knowing that Felicia is his trump card, has the baby kidnapped and installs her in an Austrian convent for her safekeeping. This move brings on the full wrath of the Patterson McCormick clan who hired detectives to try to find the baby, appealed to President Taft and even Tsar Nicholas to track down Gizzy and the child, anything to get that baby back into their family. Ultimately, they were successful the Count uh, renounced all of his claims to his daughter. He accepted divorce and $500 million, just, or rather a half million dollars, excuse me, to go away. After being away from the United States for almost eight years, Sissy finally came home. And what she needed most of all was a break from her very dramatic life. So she heads out for Jackson Hole, Wyoming with Felicia, a maid, and seven trunks of clothing. Well, Sissy immediately fell in love with the beautiful scenery and the natural way of living and became a cowgirl. Sissy and Felicia rode horses, they hunted wild game and learned all the ways of ranch living. And Sissy sent the maid and most of those trunks back to Chicago. She also fell in love with Cal Carrington, who was an authentic cowboy and must have seemed so natural and so refreshing after the count. These two people remained best friends for their entire life, but they never married. 
Sissy eventually bought Cal's Flat Creek Ranch in 1923 and made it her Western home and would return to Jackson Hole every year for the rest of her life. The ranch is still in the hands of the Patterson family, but is now a luxury hotel. And it's also on the National Register of Historic Places. Sissy divided her time between the ranch, Chicago, and Washington, DC. She had moved into her mother's home and she would travel back and forth between a private rail car. In 1924, she married Elmer Schlesinger, a brilliant lawyer, and continued this whirlwind traveling and social life. In 1927, she opened her home to a pretty good friend, President Coolidge. The White House was being um, repaired. It was under construction. So for a short time, the house on DuPont Circle became the unofficial White House. Sissy and the president hosted a state dinner honoring Charles Lindbergh, who had just completed his famous flight. And I hope you noticed I put a red arrow on uh, pointing out Lindbergh. He's that tall drink of water standing behind President Coolidge. Elmer dies, however, of a heart attack just after a few years of being married to Sissy. And Sissy is now really left more adrift than ever. But newspaper blood ran pretty deep in Joseph Medill's granddaughter. And it turns out that it was William Randolph Hearst who gave Sissy her start as an editor at his newspaper called the Washington Herald in 1930. Sissy took this job very seriously and increased readership with all the things she had learned from her brother Joe and her cousin Robert. By 1939, Sissy was able to buy out Hearst and also purchase another newspaper, creating the Washington Times Herald. And at last, Sissy was doing something she really, really loved and stayed in the newspaper business for the next 18 years. After years of heart problems, heavy smoking, and as you would agree, very dramatic living, Sissy died in her sleep at home in 1948. Everyone from diplomats to night workers at the newspaper attended her funeral in the ballroom of the Washington DC home. The house had come full circle in my opinion, hosting her debut both of her weddings, and finally her funeral. Her casket was covered with yellow roses, which were her favorite. And then it was loaded back onto her private rail car, back to Chicago, where she was buried at Graceland in the Medill plot. Joe Patterson was Sissy's brother and her hero. He married Alice Higginbotham in 1902, and theirs was the who's who's wedding of the year with over 600 people attending the wedding. Alice's father was a partner at Marshall Fields and he had been the president of the World's Columbian Exposition. So this was intended to be a marriage and a merger of two great Chicago families. But Joe was bored with marriage, with Alice, with conventional society, from the very beginning. To get away from all things Chicago, he purchased a 300 acre working farm in Libertyville, which is just south of Lake Forest and moved there with Alice. She was not amused by this. She didn't wanna live out in the country, but she agreed as long as she could have all the money she wanted to turn this home into a luxury estate. He, on the other hand, was perfectly fine, working out in the fields with his pigs, with his land, and being with his children. Eventually, though, Joe gives up farming full time to share all editorial duties with his cousin, Robert McCormick, at the Chicago Tribune. And together, the two of them start the New York Daily News, the country's very first tabloid newspaper, 
and they start the New York Daily News in 1919. So Joe is dividing his time between Libertyville, Washington, D.C., and New York City. Eleanor Patterson, and notice the spelling of her name, was the oldest child of Joe and Alice, and she was absolutely beautiful, easily crowned Deb of the Year in 1924. She dabbled in acting before the first of her three marriages. Her last marriage to Donald Baker was the one that stuck. Today, she is best known for the Eleanor Patterson Baker Trust, which provides money to animal shelters around the country. Eleanor and her husband, Donald, never lived here in Chicago. He was from the East Coast and she lived in Connecticut. Alicia and Josephine rounded out the Patterson family. They always seemed to take second stage to Eleanor and her beauty. But as it turns out, they became Joe's surrogate sons, learning to hunt wild game, fish, and fly airplanes. Together, they were both very accomplished pilots. Alicia broke the women's flight speed record from New Jersey to New York in 1930. Josephine was the youngest commercial pilot. She was only 17, and this includes men and women, boys and girls. She was the youngest to fly a mail route between Chicago and St. Louis. In the midst of their debutante season and much to their mother's horror, the two sisters took off for India where they bagged tigers, shot leopards and hobnobbed with future lords and ladies of British society. Like Sissy when she was young, these two young women lived aimless, privileged lives in search of something meaningful to do. Joe Patterson did not encourage his daughters to become journalists. So Alicia wrote articles for a while for Vogue and Liberty Magazine. Josephine worked for a while on the crime beat for the Chicago Daily News, but what she preferred most was managing her father's farms and the Wyoming ranch. Everything changed when Alicia's third husband, Harry Guggenheim, purchased a defunct newspaper in Long Island for his wife in 1940. From 1940 and in the next 20 years, Alicia was the editor and publisher of Long Island Newsday. Much like her beloved Aunt Sissy, Alicia had lived a life of fame and fortune before finding great purpose in journalism. She proved that to all concerned in 1954 when Newsday won the Pulitzer Prize, landing Alicia on the cover of Time magazine, just like her Aunt Ruth McCormick. Alicia had lived the same hard drinking, hard living life as her Aunt Sissy and her father. She died of colon cancer in 1963, um, primarily because she refused to follow doctor's orders to take it easy. Her ashes were strewn over her private hunting estate in Kingsland, Georgia. Josephine established the Alicia Patterson Foundation in her sister's honor. It is still active today and awards grants to print journalists and photographers. Josephine Patterson was seven years younger than Alicia, but they were partners in crime nonetheless. Like her sister, Josephine had a checkered education, a flamboyant social life, and an early love for flying and hunting. And Josephine also had her father's love of the soil. During the 30s and 40s, she gave up journalism to manage the Patterson family farms in Libertyville, which eventually became Hawthorne Melody Dairy. Josephine married Jay Reeve in 1936, and they had two children who she named Alice and Joseph. She then inherited Sissy's Flat Creek Ranch in Wyoming, and that ranch, as I said, is still currently owned by the family. Josephine married Ivan Albright in 1946, and some of you might know him as a very successful Chicago artist, 
from Winfield. If you don't know him, you know one of his most famous paintings. He painted the after picture, so to speak, of the portrait of Dorian Gray in the movie. Um, another artist painted Dorian Gray looking very normal and handsome. Ivan Albright painted the picture of him after he had been besieged by his demons. Ivan and Josephine had two children, Adam and Dina, and Ivan adopted Alice and Joseph and gave them his surname. Josephine wrote about raising four kids and all the trials and tribulations of that for her sister's newspaper, and her column was called Life with Junior. She went on to give up hunting big game, became an animal rights activist, and a benefactor of the arts in Vermont, where they were living. Josephine also lived long enough to see her daughter-in-law, Madeleine Albright, become the first female Secretary of State in 1977, excuse me. Madeline married Joseph Patterson Albright and they had three children together, twins, Alice and Anne, and a third daughter they named Catherine Medill Albright. Josephine died in 1996 and is buried in Vermont. If you happen to have the family tree close by, it is incorrect when you look at Josephine's lie. I realize that Josephine had one daughter named Alice Patterson Albright Hogue Arlen. Hogue and Arlen are her married names. And she had one granddaughter named Alice Patterson Albright. So the picture on um, the family tree is really Alice Albright Hogue Arlen. And um, the timeline is a little bit different there. And I think you will agree with me. It's all my fault, but this is a family that never came up with different names for everybody. They used all the same names over and over again. There's one more woman I wanna talk about before we conclude. And this woman was Joe's silent partner, both in Chicago and New York, and her name was Mary King, who was the editor of the Sunday Chicago Tribune, and the very first woman in the country to hold that kind of position for a major newspaper. She and Joe had a very long-standing and private relationship to, resulting in the birth of his only son, Jimmy. Jimmy would grow up suspecting, but not knowing until years later that Joe was his father. And Joe's three daughters didn't know of their half-brother for years. By 1925, both Joe and Mary were living separately, but equal, so to speak, in New York City, running the Daily News. Joe would come by every evening for dinner and then go home but he would still get to see little Jimmy. Alice finally granted Joe a divorce in 1938. Joe and Mary were quickly married in a New York City courthouse with Robert McCormick serving as best man. One of Alice Patterson's demands during the divorce was that her three daughters would share equally along with Jimmy shares in the massive Patterson McCormick fortune. James Patterson did marry. He never had any children. He and his wife established the James Patterson Trust, which is now the 10th largest philanthropic trust in the country. I'm sorry, I'm missing a slide. And so I will simply say the conclusion. Joseph Medill's two daughters, Kate and Nellie, were unable to have careers of their own and they lived through their children, both fearing that the other son would get ahead of their own. Neither one thought Sissy would be anything more than just a socialite. Rivalry of dreams, of inheriting rivalry and dreams of inheriting their father's great fortune and his newspaper led each woman to name their firstborn son, 
Joseph Medill. Their constant competition should have driven this family wide apart. But the cousins defied their mothers and actually got along very well. They saw themselves as an elite tribe of four, dedicating all of their energies to each other and to the families that would come. Despite scandal, multiple marriages, great loss, great wealth, the name Medill took precedent over everything. These four kids had a family saying that said, I am rich, young, beautiful, and a Medill. That's what mattered to them. I think Joseph Medill would have been very impressed with the women who made up his family. Whether joined by blood or marriage, they shared common bonds he no doubt would have had to respect. Each woman honored her family history, whether it was love of country, the arts, politics, or newspaper publishing. They shared a deep love for the land and for animals. Several were pioneers in their chosen fields, Others worked very quietly to further their passions and their philanthropic interests. They especially understood that they had a huge responsibility to do good with their great fortunes as they saw fit. And all of them, regardless whether you liked Kate or you didn't, or how you felt about any of these women, they had a fiercely independent spirit and a power that surprised anyone who tried to overshadow them. Their self-determination and accomplishments would have made Patriarch Joseph Medill very proud. So as spring comes and the flowers bloom and you go over to Cantini Park and you tour around the beautiful countryside and go into the first division, of course you will think of the men that built that place, but think of these women as well and the accomplishes, accomplishments, rather, they made to this amazing dynasty. Thank you so much. Now, 